Now, even though the guy might be a rat or not a rat, it doesn't matter. I started it. So I'm sort of obliged to finish it. He's sitting down on the, on the lower bunk and he just goes back against the wall and his eyes go huge. His hands fall to his side and his eyes are like this. And Phil turns on him with the blade, right? The MA would toss in with the AB to make the hit. Yeah. And I think the Nestors, uh, the NF would back the blacks. You know, it was, that was the way it went. And five of these little Nestors came from behind the thing, knocked his spotter out of the way, jumped on his chest. And right in front of me, they're plunging him. And the guns start going off. And I'm just like a deer in the lights. I don't know what to do, right? Well, this is the fine line, isn't it? And, you know, one of my rules was don't get high. Don't get drunk and don't get high. Because the one thing you got going is your common sense and your sharpness. Now, we're in the upper yard. And the guards with the Mini 14s, if, if a fight breaks out, if anything breaks out, they just open up. This was the first time that I ever saw every race just enthusiastically pour into a room and sit down to watch the show. When the show started, Arnold, he was there, but he wouldn't take off his shirt. I mean, what the guys really wanted to see was they wanted to compare their physiques with Arnold. He says, you either the brave in here or the stupidest in here. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he went, woo-wee. Before the podcast, here's a quick word from our sponsor. There's this new podcast I want to tell you about. I've already listened to it and it's great. I think you'll really enjoy it. I won't give too much away, but it's called American Vigilante. And it's about this guy called KC, who takes the law into his own hands. He rescues kidnapped children. He hunts down missing people. And he goes head to head with the Mexican Mafia. He calls himself a monster hunter. And here's the trailer. <sighs> I'm an American vigilante. I have a question for you. What would you do if someone you cared about was abducted, taken from you? Would you call me? Would you care about how I got them back? <sighs> Download. American Vigilante, now. It's good, right? KC has never told his story before, but he's decided now is the time. I'll be listening every Monday. All you have to do is search for American Vigilante in your podcast app. Do that now and let me know what you think of it. Check out the American Vigilante link in the description box below this video. I'm in such a good mood today. We have got two absolutely fantastic guests being filmed in the studio. John Abbott and Tug of War after John. So it's going to be amazing. So pages and pages and pages of questions have come in for both of these guests. Huge thank you for you guys. For sending them in if you've not seen john's first three podcasts i mean part one now i think it's up to almost half a million combined he's well over a million views and the first one if you're not familiar with john at all and many people are now because of what's been put out on the channel but part one there's a, a hell of a shootout in the beginning sadly john loses his brother ends up in san quentin escapes from san quentin there's another shoot out there, and he's got these uh, pretty hardcore crime partners. There's another shoot out on the Canadian border. John loses his crime partners. They get shot. John himself almost gets shot. There's a situation with a cop on the Canadian border. Then he ends up in Canadian prison. 
the media put out a crazy story about him linking him to the cia saying he's a james bond super villain with an iq of almost 200 trained in the deadly japanese martial arts and on and on and on and on it goes many people have compared him to the the, the true crime um good grief what's his name the um the actor Christopher Walken, yeah, yeah, yeah. The true crime, Christopher Walken with his mild manner. People are wondering how on earth did he get involved in these things? Perhaps, James, we could throw up at this point of the podcast the picture John sent us of you massive. Oh, uh, well, you could. You, you can better, we, are we okay to put that one on, on it? You can, but you have to show the original, the first one too, for yeah. the contrast. Otherwise, you know, it's just another guy who lifts and weights, right? Where did you send me those? Did you send them me by email or what? Or, or, Phone I, I think I showed you the picture, and you, you took a photo. Them. You took a photo of of each picture. Are you able to like send them us? Well, I've I, got a new phone. You see? Oh, you tossed the phone, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But if you could perhaps um, send them us somehow, oh, by email, perhaps attach them to. An well, email. I'll, I'll 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 try and do something. I'm I'm pretty analog, but I'll, I'll work at it. <laughs> One of the stories from I think it was San Quentin. You didn't get into too much detail about it, but you dropped his name out there was when Arnold Schwarzenegger came to visit. Could you perhaps give us a bit more detail on that one? Well, this was the first time that I ever saw every race just enthusiastically pour into a room and sit down to watch the show. I mean, the blacks filled up the whole back corner all the way down. They were all in for it, even though these were two white guys coming in to do a show which sort of took everyone's a bit back. And the Mexicans, Chicanos, they were all there too. Everybody was there. Terminator. So, well, this is before the Terminator. What was it? He'd, um, I, I don't know if you followed Arnold, but he won six European bodybuilder championships. I remember that movie, Pumping Iron. Well, this is the one. He started with Pumping Iron down at Gold's Gym, I think it was, in, in Venice, Las California. And then Arnold, of course, it's right in Hollywood. And so they, you know, directors said, we got to have this body beautiful on, in the video, right? And so they convinced him to do Conan the Barbarian. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I've it's seen a bit, it. It's a bit, bit cheesy. A bit. <laughs> I was a kid, so I was like in awe of all of his yeah, stuff. Beefcake stuff. Yeah. Of course, he never could lose that German accent, which kind of limited his... his I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, he did Conan the Barbarian. The problem was... In his mind, he's like a world champion bodybuilder. But once you get into the Hollywood scene, you're schmoozing with the directors and endless partying and drinks and here and there and eating out. And you're not working out like you used to. And so when the show started, Arnold, he was there, but he wouldn't take off his shirt. <laughs> mm. Instead, he, he brought Franco Colombo who's his running, his, his dog, his running mate. And they'd been, they started out in Venice actually plastering walls and brick, doing brickies work together. Wow. To, to pay for the proteins and the protein and the, and the gym, you know, entrance fees and all the rest of it. So we brought Franco Colombo along. He's called Pocket Hercules. <laughs> and one of his tricks was he would take a old rubber hot water bottle and blow it up. Now, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but that was one of the things he did, part of his show. The rubber hot water bottle that you slept with to yes. keep you warm at night, yeah. he would blow that up. He'd blow it like a balloon. Ooh, so he's got like iron breath. Yeah, he's got something. Right? And he took off his, his shirt and his kicks and he was doing the thing, but they really wanted Ar Arnold because, I mean, the thing is with little guys, they look really buffed because their muscles and their bones are not very long, which compacts the muscle and makes them look more buff than bigger guys. But Arnold's six six. I mean, he's huge. And for him to to get that mass and that size, you know, it was it was, you know, breath stopping. So everybody was screaming, take it off, take it off. And Arnold's getting a bit nervous about all this, right? Now <laughs> For us, it, it was just being in the room with him was like exciting because I mean, in the, in the joint is so slow and the same old, same old is just overwhelming. So we were so just glad to be there. But I was there with our, our crew and one guy, he whispered in my ear, he said, uh, you see, see that guy with the, the Coleman's cap on? He's a rat. 
And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said he just ratted on a stash of, jo- of, of uh, uh, like knives, like shanks down in the metal shop. He said the supervisor came down, told everybody that if the shanks weren't, you know, like give it up, then the thing was going to get shut down. They're all lose their jobs. And this guy went over to the supervisor and just pointed out where it was. Whoa. So, you know, I was feeling pretty high on the moment, right? And so as the show came to a close and people started heading for the door, in a moment of just exuberant uh, feeling, I just snatched the cap off this guy's head. And just tossed it to one of my mates. Now, I didn't even think about it, right? It just it just seemed like the thing to do, right? And sure enough, there were repercussions. Cause when we we got funneled, everybody's pushing for the door, and you push out onto the big yard, right? The upper yard. And in the moment when we pushed out, when people are jostling each other, somebody threw a punch at me. And I don't know, I didn't see him, and I didn't see who it was, I didn't see what the punch was, but somehow I reacted to something. I'm not sure what I was reacting to, something instinctual, and I just turned my head, and he whisked by my head, knocked my headband off. Now, we're in the upper yard, and the guards with the mini-14s, if, if a fight breaks out, if anything breaks out, they just open up. So basically, we're looking at a lethal situation here. So, I'm thinking about the, the, up, the, the gunners, and this fella, he was, didn't, obviously didn't care. He just wanted to get his point across. So, I ducked down, scooped my headband, and just disappeared through the crowd and made my way to the cell. Now, I didn't see who did it, but my guys did. And this is good and bad, because if no one saw it, then I could just shine it on. But they saw who did it, and they came right over and told me who did it. So we had to do something. Now, this is a harsh one because I'm in the wrong, actually. I'd, I'd snatch this guy's cap. And so if I, because I did that, I have to take whatever comes, it's, it's on me. Now, even though the guy might be a rat or not a rat, it doesn't matter. I started it. So I'm sort of obliged to finish it. Anyway. What were the stats on this guy? Was he a big guy? Well, no, the, the guy I grabbed the cap from, he was, he was skinny. He was, it turned out he was a punk. When I mean punk, I mean not just no heart, but he was a punk. The guy was punking him. Yeah, yeah. And the guy who swung on me was his daddy. <laughs> now, I didn't know anything about this, and this is where I was in the wrong, because anytime you make a move on somebody, you should have done your intelligence first, right? And this was all in the white race. Yes, this is, everybody's white in this one. So his dad, his daddy swung on me, and uh, you know, it turned out he was one of these hardcore old Oklahoma uh, farm boy kind of convicts. I don't know if you ever ran into any of them, but a lot of them confed they call them. They're tough, and they play by hard old rules, and uh, you gotta you gotta give them credit. You can't. You're not looking at some cityfied, you know, punk with these boys. So, you know, it was Horky and Whitey and Phil and I and another guy. We're standing around. What should we do? And I, and I said, well, we got to move on them before they have a chance to to arm up. So, I mean, we we got what we had on hand. Do you remember the rely from last time? The reliable cut down putty knife and the and the ice pick. I'll put the link for part three in the description <laughs> box if you want to get the details of that one. <laughs> so, in San Quentin, I don't know if you ever watched uh, some of the video, but they have great long tiers, and the guards start at one end of the tier and they rack the iron and they loosen the bolts. But then the guard has to come along individually and key each cell shut. Now, the th- what we thought is if we move on these guys before they're locked up, there's no way they can get to anything. That meant we we had to move on them when the guy, when the guards at the end had just racked the lock so it was open, but before they came down and keyed it shut. So we came down the back steps and they were on the third tier. And 
sure enough, we just burst into the cell. Frank, Frank, fast Frank for Joni, he was on the door watching. And w- there was another guy at one end who talked, like suddenly started a conversation with the bulls if they were getting too close. So we burst in. And the kid's punk, he just, he's sitting down on the, on the lower bunk. And he just goes back against the wall and his eyes go huge. His hands fall to his side and his eyes are like this. And Phil turns on him with the blade, right? And I go to plunge it at the, at the oaky, but he does a Spider-Man on me. I mean, he's fast. Remember I told you I went into hyperspeed? Well, he went into hyperspeed. And I don't know what he did, but he managed to spring up onto the upper bunk and then push himself into a cupboard. So only his feet were kicking out in his arms. And so he had his back and his body inside this kind of cupboard that was up there. And he's kicking, so I can't really get him. And I'm kind of swinging in effectually a bit. And then Frank says, uh, time to go, boys. They're about eight cells away. So we wrap it up. And out we go and slide back down the tier, walk down the back, or excuse me, walk up the back, uh, the back steps. And it's all over. The beef was squashed. There was no... Uh... Well, it... it it, this is where some of the white politics came in because he'd swung at me, but he hadn't really got me. And I'd swung at him and hadn't really got him. And the, the word came down from up above, the old white hierarchy, that good white boys shouldn't be doing this stuff to each other. And so I wanted to check and see if this was actually the case, so I lined up when the guy went to t- to Chow, I lined up about four people behind him and just wanted to see if I got a reaction. But he played it stone cold cool. He just, there was near a move, near a glance, nothing. And so that was one of those, again, that's one of those moments when things can go really bad. But I was lucky and luck has a lot to do with it. I told you it was going to be a good day. What a story. I'm absolutely gripped. And just, just because it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's permanently linked in my mind with him. Whenever I see Arnold, I'm right back there with the ice pack. (laughs) (laughs) So you set the table then about this, you know, how everyone was racially divided watching Schwarzenegger and Columbo. How long was the show? What did they actually say to you guys? Well, they were talking about, you know, lifting weights and about, diet and this and that, answering questions from the crowd. I mean, what the guys really wanted to see was they wanted to compare their physiques with Arnold. I mean, that's what the the, the serious lifters were there for. And Arnold wasn't giving it to them. He was trying to give them, he was trying to keep the main course hidden and just give them dessert and a few little uh, bits of lettuce and bread, right? And so they were crying for red meat, right? So that was... So in, in a way, it didn't work out for Arnold because uh, he was hoping for more movie fan reaction maybe, but because he had his f- one foot still in that Venice gym weightlifting world, and then one foot as a Hollywood star, it was sort of a bit of a transition for him. So was the pressure on him then to take his top off? Yeah. And, and it, could you see that he was like, how, how did he react to that pressure? He, 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 he was getting red in the face and uh, Franco was trying to cover for him, you know? Because uh, Arnold's not, you know, he's he's not that kind of a guy. He's He takes that seriously, the bodybuilding seriously. And to be called on his most serious card, it sort of caught him out. And do you think these guys that were serious lifters had bigger, much bigger physiques than Arnold then? I don't think so. I mean, the thing is, Arnold had access to all the machinery that you need and all the dietary stuff. I mean, those guys, they, I think it's like four or 5,000 calories of protein supplements and stuff a day. Wow. Now, in the joint, you're looking at, you know, what? Industrial mashed potatoes. Slop. Boiled beans and a bit of sloppy joe yeah. with some jello. Yeah. Yeah. So. Do the lifters get stuff smuggled in, though? Well, they can buy sardines and peanut butter and stuff on the canteen. Beef jerky. And so they do. The, the canteen was there, but you know, a good job was $30 a month. You know, a normal job with the mop was $20 a month. Uh, you know. And what, 
you've mentioned stories about the weightlifting, you know, things that have happened on the weights. What weightlifting equip equipment was available back then for the fellas? Well, they, they didn't have machines. What they had were free weights. So dinosaur bones, you know, everything you might need. And do you remember with that story about Kemper? Yeah, Edmund Kemper. I think that was in part one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was Vacaville. They, they wanted to test him because he was in 6'9", a huge guy, but they wanted to see if he had the Six power nine. to go with it. And so they, they took every single wheel, these like whatever they are, um, great big iron wheels, and just filled one of those, you know, like uh, bench press bars on both sides. And he lifted it. He benched it. So, you know. What was it like to be in the presence of Kemper? What was his? Well, I wasn't on the medical side. Yeah. I think your man, uh, Kane, was yeah, on the medical side. Yeah, our first side. podcast guest, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I saw Kemper, but I never interacted with him. Yeah. I, and this story was, it was the one that went around, you know, the yard at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, there was just a, a set of bars on the main corridor between the medical side and the reception side. And so we saw Kemper, because he was on the main line. I, I mean, which is kind of surprising when you think about it. The nature of his crimes, yeah. I mean, wouldn't you call that, I mean, would that fit into your category of Chomo or? He would be in um, Supermax as a serial killer. Wasn't he killing like college age girls, was it? Hitchhikers, yeah. Yeah. So, it, it it would be bad. It, he would be he would be. Uh, they try and do something in this day and age against him. But I think back then it was a lot different, wasn't it? And that's why people who watch these videos they say, "Oh, John said this. That could never have happened. I was in this prison." Well, you weren't there in the bloody seventies. Rules have changed over the years in prisons, and every prison's got a different culture depending upon who's leading the gangs, what kind of rules the guards are enforcing, and. It, it, it's changed, hasn't it, as it's become the modern day just warehousing of people situation well, for profits. One of the biggest differences I see, some of the comments the guys make is, well, you know, when I talk about having weight bars on the weight pit, guys are just shocked, right? What? You mean, you mean weight bars? Because I, I think now if they have weights, they're like those enclosed machines. So, you don't Pull up bars, dip bars, things right, like that. So that you can't, making it to a weapon yeah in arizona they they had weights back when you guys had weights but they yeah. also come out at the, at the department of corrections like a lot of them out at the same time and this is why you know two of the the worst hits i ever saw were or I, one i saw right after it happened when i was right there in front of it were guys bench pressing because you're totally vulnerable and the beauty of it is if you stab the guy while he's bench pressing he's going to drop the weights onto his throat <sighs> he's either going to break his jaw and take his trachea out and he might just that might just kill him <sighs> He saw that twice. Yeah. Well, the 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 one. Remember, I, I think I told you the uh, one of the the two biggest guys I ever saw were these blacks, and one of them got plunged while he was bench pressing on the North Block Punishment Yard, right in the heart, and he came out, and the arterial blood was just onto the thing. He was being carried on the stretcher right past me, and the strange thing was, there were six kids from a scared straight program up against the wall exactly at the time when they carried this guy out. <laughs> well, the scared straight program couldn't be more effective than that. Could well, I, I couldn't help myself. I said, take a look, punk. And, and, <laughs> and they were all black kids, you know, they were just like this, this huge guy, massive guy. Yeah. You know, and like, the, we don't want to go. The lights were going and it was right by the great big steel door of hell yeah. and the lights were going and everything. And they're like these little kids skinny little ghetto kids up against the wall and, and had he got hit because of his own race sanctioning that it was a no no it was, was a it black warfare? black guerrilla war family the warfare guy. yeah it was the yeah. ab black guerrilla family stuff and sometimes the ma would toss in with the ab to make the hit yeah and i think the nesters uh the nf would back the blacks you know it was that was the way it went it is a unique time in prison culture and i think that's why people find your story so fascinating versus the modern prison stories. Well, what, what was the other hit that happened on the way? Did you, did you tell us that? One? Well, th that was the first one. When I first yeah. went to Vacaville, there was a um, uh, half white, half Mexican, half Chicano guy lifting weights. And he was, you know, for me, he was like 
he was in great shape, good physique, and he was bench pressing. And uh, five guys, five nesters came from behind the, the uh, handball court. You know, the look then was, they used to wear shirts like this, tied up like this. Seeing the pictures loose, online, yeah. Loose headbands right on like the eyebrows. Shirts. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bonnerud pants, right? And five of these little nesters came from behind the thing, knocked his spotter out of the way, jumped on his chest. And right in front of me, they're plunging him. And the guns start going off. And I'm just like a deer in the lights. I don't know what to do, right? And the blacks, they're so fast. They just know exactly what to do. Boom, they're all gone, right? I like antelope. So I finally make my move, but I'm too late. And I'm locked in the, in the... See, everybody wants to get out the gate before it gets shut down. Because if you're in there, then you're a suspect for whatever reason, right? So, all right. Well, talking about the, you know, in the jails, the racial division still goes on to this day in jails and prisons across America. So there's been all these race wars going on. And there's a story here about uh, where you went to a black Muslim meeting in CDC Vacaville. What happened there? Oh, wow. That was, uh, that was unforgettable. So it's, it's Sunday and in Vacaville, they have one chapel area, and each religious group goes there at a different time. And, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian background. I mean, I, I had to go to, uh, I had to listen to, to sort of the preacher every morning before school started, so I was a bit tired of that. And I'd heard of this uh, black Muslim thing, and I thought, well, I wonder what that's about, right? Now, guys, if, you know, you'd hear people say this and that, but until you actually see something yourself, you really don't know. So I just thought, well, I'll just join the line. Now, I don't know, do you, do you have black Muslims when you were in? Yeah, and actually we, all right, so there was a, in the jail, which is very transitory and the rules are a bit, bit crazier. In the prison system, every, everything is relaxed because people are settled and the rules are set. But in, in the jail, it was, it was um, the things that happened in the jail could not happen in prison. Um, the Italian mafia in my pod took over from the Aryan Brotherhood briefly, briefly, and this was it, it was quite incredible how they did it. And um, the head of the Italian mafia says, "Right, let's all go out on a field trip. Let's go to Muslim services." And um, so we all we all hit hit the road for Muslim services when they called it, and we went and like the the. The Muslim uh, imam, when we arrived, he was like on the hot button to the guards. He thought there was going to be a race riot or something. He couldn't understand why are these white boys trying to infiltrate the Muslim services. Something's going to kick off. But but what happened was um, after the Italian mafia guys, after it went back to the skinheads in control, the Italian um, mafia guys, guys were sent off to prison and stuff. The, the AB guys were like grilling all the whites saying, were you one of the whites who that day went to Muslim services? I, I got grilled. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I got grilled. No, so you didn't go. <laughs> yeah, I went. Oh, you did go. Okay. But when I got grilled by the Aryans after the Italians lost the temporary stronghold, when I got, we all got, all the white boys from that pod got grilled. And they were like, did you go to Muslim, the Aryan Brotherhood guys were like, did you go to Muslim services that day? And I was like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Because they were looking to smash people for going to the Muslim services. Mm. Yeah. So that it's a very uh, tricky situation that you're getting yourself into here because f as far as I'm concerned, you would have to have that sanctioned. And there's no way that the ABs would sanction that a white boy going to the, the, the Muslim well, services. Well, I wasn't even, I was at Vacaville reception. I wasn't even aware of the AB or all that politi okay. politics stuff. I just, I just thought it's a slow day. Nothing's happening. I mean... <laughs> It, you know, this would be interesting, right? That was just like for us, we're going to have a day trip. We're going to go to Muslim services. We're so bored. Yeah, well, I mean. It was quite cool, actually. We stayed and talked to them. It was, it was interesting. I don't know if, you've, if you've, you've, you've seen too many black Muslims, but usually in, in the joint, they dress nicely. They're, they clean themselves. They present themselves well, and they're polite to the guards. Yeah, yeah, they are polite and so peaceful. Generally, and sold, th that's, uh, that's how they play it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the, anyway, so I... I I went to, they called the Muslim services and I joined the queue. And this big barrel chested black guard looks at me and he says, you don't want to go there. 
And I said, uh, look, everybody welcome. <laughs> big sign, big sign above the door. <laughs> and, the, and the white guard, like, he, he thinks maybe I'm stupid or something. In a loud voice, he says, no, you really don't want to go there. And I, the same thing, right? Just give him the innocent face and, you know. But then the first strange thing happened, okay? I noticed that everybody who went to Muslim services was being frisked like patted down professionally, but it wasn't being done by the guards. It was being done by the black Muslims themselves. And so they frisked each person who was going in, each black guy, and then they frisked me. So I went in and sat down. As you approached them though, did they like say, you don't want to come they, in here? They just played it cool. They didn't say anything. The guards had already covered that, right? Okay. And so I go and sit on about the third pew from the front because I want to get a good I don't want to be right in the front, but I want to get a good view of what's going on. And so the imam or the priest or whatever they call themselves, he shows up and he says, he just looks at me and he looks around and he says, the devil white race put the white man on top of the blacks and the blacks have been enslaved by the blue eyed white devil and the blue eyed white devil is here today. And he looks at <laughs> me like this. And when he does that, Two blacks are at the end of my pew, just get up and leave. Like, you know, it's like, you know, is this guy authorizing a hit right now in the middle of the thing, right? And I'm looking at him, and he says, as Elijah Muhammad said, he said, the white man, the, the blue eyed white devil, he's going to control the blacks for 6,000 years. But he says, those 6,000 years are done. It's over. And now it's our time. And Yakub, the big headed scientist who made blue eyed white devil, oh, him and all of his minions are going to fall. And I'm just looking at this, listening, oh, God damn, this is like straight up, you know, race war stuff, right? And meanwhile, at the back, people are saying, tell it like it is, tell it like it is, brother. Tell the truth now, tell the truth. It was like a revival meeting. And he gets his head of steam and he says, and those 6,000 years are up, and now it's going to be the Black Brothers' time, and we're going to destroy the blue-eyed white devils. And this went on for about half an hour, just ranting and raving about the blue-eyed white devil and Yakub the scientist and W.D. <laughs> Fard, who came down from the Lord, right? And I was just stunned. I mean, I'd never been, I'd read about Hitler youth rallies and stuff like that, but I'd never even been to something which would pass for like a Nazi rally. <laughs> but I'd just been called the devil, right? So what can I do? So instead of looking sheepish, I just put my arms out like this on the on the pew and looked the guy in the eyes and just smiled at him the whole time, right? Wow. And he just, he got a head, head of steam up. Obviously, I'd fired him up. It, he was going, you know. Yeah. The Lord was upon him, as they say. And uh, this ended. And uh, I'm just sort of amazed at what I'd just seen. Now think about this. You've just been in the chapel preaching race war. And I, I thought to myself, what does this say about the CDC guards? Because they must know what's going on. They must be completely up on it. So is this just like stress management for the blacks, right? Blow off a bit of steam listening to this stuff? Or do they not care at all and just just go for actions over words? So if the Muslims keep it polite, well-dressed, out of beefs, out of the drugs, then they're willing to go with whatever they have to say. I couldn't make up my mind if it was both or just one of them or what it was. How did you get out of there? Well, it, nobody stopped me. It was like I had an invisible aura of like, uh, I don't know, all the blacks just kind of went past me like this. Like they don't, Maybe they thought I was going to get hit right away and didn't want my, my blood on them or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but... So I left and I thought that was a pretty exciting Sunday morning. Wow. And uh, anyway, finally, I went up to my tier later on. And, and next day, the guy next to me, he was black. Now he looks at me and he says, you the white boy went to the black Muslim meeting. I nod my head. He says, you either the bravest motherfucker in here or the stupidest <laughs> motherfucker in here. <laughs> And then he looked at me and he went, woo-wee, and <laughs> smiled. <laughs> and I, I knew I wasn't the, the bravest motherfucker in there, so. 
Yeah, the religious services is something else. I remember um, people coming in and like talking in tongues and stuff. Did you ever see anything like oh, that? Oh, no, I, I wasn't there for the Christian one, like I said. Yeah. Um, did you have any other religious services experiences? N well, no, that, I had enough of that. I, f I figured if I went back again, that would be tempting fate, right? Yeah. Do you remember that story about how the, the Bushmen stole the meat from the, the lions? Have you guys watched that? It's brilliant, isn't it? I, I, after the last podcast with John, I went and watched... I'm going to put the clip in the description box. You've got to watch this because literally the lions are tearing this meat apart. There's blood all over them. There's several of them. And these skinny ass bushmen like tiptoe up. And they're like, the lions are like, hold on a minute. This should not be happening. We're eating our food. We could eat these guys quite easily. And you can see the brains trying to process like, Something's not quite right here, and the, the, it, it puts him in a state of stunnedness just for so many seconds. And they back off. The lions back off, and these guys are like, "Grab some meat," and they and they get going, and the lions come back. But that's a dangerous occupation. Well, the reason I mention it is is this this thing with the black Muslims reminds me of that story, because just walking in there. Somehow, I don't know, it, it's like that, that moment of shock, like, what's this guy doing? What's going on? And I just managed to slip out of there without yeah. any drama, right? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting parallel. Mm. So, let's have a, we got tons of questions and tons of... Um, well, you might answer a few uh, people's questions if you've got some, I don't know. I'm going to go over to the questions then. Um, all right. What was the worst meal John had in any prison? So that's any prison in your life, Canada, California, wherever. Well, that would have to be at the Wairika County Jail when we got the two, the two silver dollar size pancakes and the tepid coffee. And that was breakfast. And lunch was one slice of bologna and two slices of white bread. And that was it to live. And that was the story where I was, well, I started, you know, taking other people's uh, <laughs> meals just to, uh, you know, stay healthy. So that would have to be the worst, right? Thank you for the question, Maid V. From Mind Soup, John seems like a big reader. What is his favorite book? Uh, they do like to read. I mean, that's actually it brings up an interesting topic. Um, have you ever heard of Louis L'Amour? Yes. Okay. Guys? The brand. Heard? Going back to the brand now, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Louis L'Amour writes these cowboy stories, except they're all sort of one pattern cowboy stories. The, you know, the steely-eyed, six-foot-tall, quiet fella, hand goes down to that well-worn pistol, flash, and bang, 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 the three bad guys are dead. And... That was, Louis L'Amour's books were everywhere in the joint at that time. And when you look back on it, that's what I think some of those guys were trying to do, who were in the AB, for example, or the Mexican Mafia. They saw themselves as those kind of heroes of the range, you know, the Wild West. And in Louis L'Amour, violence is, it's always a good thing. It's how you work out problems. Now, do you notice how in my stories, people don't get stabbed? I mean, there's knives might get shown, knives can flash around, but, pe but people don't get stabbed. Cadillac Jack didn't get stabbed. You know, the Mexican, Mendez the Mexican didn't get stabbed. Because in the real world, if you want to stay on the line, or if you're on the street and want to stay on the street, you just can't be knifing people and whacking people left, right, and center because of the heat. I mean, Phil, and he was in the business, he told me, he says, if you try not to kill anybody. And I said, why is that, Phil? He says, well, the heat never ends. You know, there's no statute of limitations. It just carries on and on and on. So if you watch, if you see what the AB were doing, they always would go f for the violent solution. Now, that terrorized people, but it meant 
by the time I was I was there, they were disappearing from the line. And sh- shortly after, they just all disappeared into the supermax. And any A-B stories happened in Pelican Bay or Adjustment Center. And that's where they stayed. And that fella, what was his name? Mike Thompson. So you recommended that we interview Mike Thompson. And Mike Thompson had agreed to be interviewed. And it was all scheduled. And then he got rearrested. So I don't know what his legal status is right now. Now, Mike Thompson told his story, and it, it was breathtaking. Some other channels did criticize him. So he was a very controversial character. Now, there's always blowback when anything goes viral. And there's another YouTube channel I watch, a pretty hardcore guy who's been to California prison. He's a really good um, storyteller, good YouTuber, and he, he hates... Mike Thompson, he's done a lot exposing Mike Thompson. But I would still like to get Mike Thompson on because of what you said to me. You said, look, this was a unique period of time. And no matter what controversies and what this guy's done, he was in the mix and he's got some hardcore stories well, from it, that time. To, he, to, he, was to, on the, he was on the council of the Aryan Brotherhood. So, I mean, the fact that he turned into a rat is why the guys trash him. Now, the interesting thing for me isn't whether he was a rat or not a rat. The fact is, he was in one of the top members of the AB, and he was there when I was, basically when I was there. And he, I think five years later, turned over and informed on them, and all kinds of people went to court. Now, even though he informed on all those people and worked for the man, he still ended up doing 45 years in prison. 45 years. So if you want to play Louis L'Amour and be the death-dealing cowboy, then you're going to be doing time in the adjustment center all day. And Mike Thompson is a perfect example of what happens. Even though he turned over, he still done 45 years. And your man, Kane, he wasn't even a serious player. How much time did he do? 34. 34 years. Basically, they've lost their lives. They get out when they're sort of granddad material. So that's one of the differences in my stories. You, you try to avoid the violence. And, and when you deal with people, you try to keep the violence to a minimum because you want a future in life. But these guys, they, they, they live for that mythos to be the, you know, the death-dealing cowboy hero. And I think it got to be a bit of a drug and you know maybe they shouldn't have been reading so much Louis L'Amour and somebody else might have been better. How did you know where to draw the line with the Louis L'Amour antics then so that you could guarantee that you would get out without putting in so much violence that you would stay forever versus just enough violence so that you wouldn't be perceived as weak? Well this is the fine line isn't it and you know One of my rules was don't get high. Don't get drunk and don't get high. Because the one thing you got going is your common sense and your sharpness. And if you dull your sharpness, then who knows what's going to happen. So it meant that I didn't get, I turned down, you know, people say, here, let's do a line, you know, let's let's shoot some dope. And I say, whoa, not me, not me. And I, I stayed away from that for that very reason, because I want to keep that, that um, sense of myself, the sense of the situation. I want all the readings, the input to be real. I don't want to be, you know, the thing with drunks is they, they're not seeing the real world. They're seeing things all skew if, and they come to things the wrong way, and they overreact in situations when they shouldn't, and they'll do something. They might kill somebody in the street, right in front of people, and there's no thought as to the ramifications, what's going to happen in the future, you know. So here's a story for you about Canada. <sighs> Have you ever heard of a, I guess you wouldn't, it's called Stony Mountain. It's a Canadian medium. It's the most dangerous Canadian medium in, might even be a maximum now, uh, in Canada. And the reason is they're mostly Indians. And their high, the high they like is Pruno. And so the guys drink and then they go wild. So one famous case happened while I was in, in, I was in Moscow, which was the same kind of medium, and they were in Stony Mountain, and they just 
got drunk and killed two guards. The first two guards that came, they just killed him. Wow. No, <sighs> killing guards in America, well, you're going to be, you'll never get out. You'll be like that man, uh, the AB guy who killed those guards. And I think they kept him in a 24 hour lockup for 40 years until he died, right? Tortured and everything, yeah. So, but in, in Canada, the, the reaction was keep the pruno down and allow pot and, and hash to circulate. Just, not, you know, just kind of turn a blind eye to it. Pragmatic. To keep the edge off, right? Because alcohol, people just lose it. So for me, it was don't get high and keep sharp. So was it Mike Thomas or Mike Thompson? Mike Thompson. So Mike Thompson then, are you saying that he was one of the founders of the AB? I don't know if he was a founder, but he was on the council for a while. So what is the council? Well, they're the, the, they're the group of shot callers who decide what happens and who gets hit. And does that California council control the whole of the AB now throughout the entire country? Uh, uh, I've been out of, out of that world for so long, I have no idea. Back, but it, back then, it had it, the most power, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, the California it AB. Did. It did. And they, they were the ones who, what happened was the, the California guys got bagged up and they got sent to federal prisons. Then they started the AB in federal prisons. So, and of course, you've heard of the DC blacks. No. Well, federal prisons got a big problem. And the problem is that federal prisoners usually, they're nearly all people who get sent for federal beefs you know, counterfeiting, big time bank robberies, cross state frauds, big time drug dealers. Politicians. So it's a different, if different caliber of prisoner. The state is more hardcore, isn't it? Right, except in one case, Washington DC is governed by the US Congress. It's not a state. So every prisoner is a federal prisoner. And so you got every street criminal from Washington, D.C. goes into the federal system. Wow. So they form the biggest gang, and they're straight up ghetto, hardcore uh, gangbangers. And so the AB, the federal AB, got into a, a war with them, which is how they all got banged up forever on RICO charges for, you know, they intercepted a few of those kites they send back and forth, and a few. You know, a few people turning over and, and that knocked off basically the AB membership in the federal prison. So it's a unique situation. And the AB, did that start in the 50s, was it? Or the 60s? I, I'd say the 60s, but... 60s? Yeah. Do you know what prison it, it came out of? It would be San Quentin probably, or Folsom, one of the two. And was it... The original purpose of it was just as a defense mechanism against the other races because the whites were a minority. Was that that's what I've read? Well, that's what I thought. But Mike Thompson, he said that they just uh, wanted to control the assets in the prison. They wanted to control the drug trade and make the money. So he 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 put an, a predatory spin on it. But of course, that's after the fact. After he's turned over. And is that something that it evolved into? Yeah, I, I would business? say that's probably what happened. Yeah. Because as I told you before, the whites have the weakest hand in California prisons because um, they don't come from ghettos like the Chicanos and the blacks. The whites, some of them have hardcore state raised backgrounds and they make, you know, the sort of hardest core convicts. But a, a, a huge whack of them come from all these little white bread counties where. You, you know, car theft, uh, you killed your wife, these kind of beefs. And so they don't, they don't join the gangs and it makes, means the whites are always outnumbered in terms of warriors ready to raise to the call, so. And there was different cultures then that were incorporated into the brand. So there was like the Irish, wasn't there some of the Irish um, tattoos were incorporated into it as well as the the, the well, German shamrock, stuff. The shamrock, the shamrock. Yeah, the shamrock was one of the the indicators. Uh, but again, I'm, I wasn't into that. So, but was didn't they actually credit? Um, what was the author you just mentioned? La Louis Lamour. Isn't he credited like in the inception of of the AB? They incorporated his stuff into it. Isn't that acknowledged? Well, I don't 
I didn't hear anything about about the AB on that side, but I did see. Have you ever? There's a there's a Chicano uh, website. I think it's called Perspex News or Perplex News or something like that, and it's run by some old Chicano Emmy member who got religion. But what he's what he's done is he he tells the tale, you know, photograph by photograph, death by death, of each founding member of the Emmy. Wow. And he's he directly, you know, attributes some of the attitudes to Louis L'Amour and what they were reading. And the Emmy were pretty closely tied up with uh, with the brand, you know. Do you know this guy's name? We need, we need to get a hold of him, like Mike Thompson. Well, it's on the, it's on the, it's on Perspex YouTube. News. Yeah, something like that. But it's all, he basically goes down. Imagine you took sort of uh, photos of every gang member and when they died and when they were joined the gang. And he just, he must have somebody in police who's helping him because he just goes down the list showing each photo. And because he had photos on the yard of his carnals and this guy and that guy, and then who turned on who and who stabbed who in the back, and he, he runs it all down. I mean, the the war in San Quentin that he describes started over a pair of tennis shoes, which you know some Emmy member jammed somebody else for in Westra Familia, I think it was. All over a pair of tennis shoes. And Have you watched that movie America Me? Yeah. How about that, May? What do you think of that? Well, he got a lot of heat from that. In fact, they threatened his life, and uh, I think some people got hurt behind that too. Some of the people involved, because it was a bit too close to the bone. Because he was an MA, he was on the MA council, and it was it the first at first they were happy to do it, but then of course it got a bit too. And some of the other ones got grumpy. You weren't in on the main play. And then there's the money. Um, anytime you get guys together like that, they're not doing things out of the goodness of their heart. And when they hear Hollywood, they want to see the big bucks come out. And if you tell them there are no big bucks, they're not going to believe you. They, they've got a conspiratorial frame of mind. Especially so. when that was a smash hit. I remember watching it yeah. as a kid. Everyone was talking about it. Yeah. Well, he's a pretty good actor, that guy who played that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next question then, tying into literature. This is from Cordless Screwdriver. Does John study philosophy of Stoicism, Romans, Greeks, etc.? Well, you certainly, I mean, if you read, you end up reading stuff like that. And certainly it's useful in prison. <laughs> Stoic, Stoic philosophy is where you want to be. Epictetus. Yeah, you want to cut down on the, you know, the appetites, you know, work on your strength and your virtues. Like, for example... Um, I'm not naturally that brave. I have to, I have to like pucker it up, right? Mm. I mean, I know this because I contrast myself to Phil Thompson, who was fearless. Fear didn't even, there wasn't a, a flicker in his eyes. He just went into every situation like the Terminator and it just how it went down, whatever happened, right? It's like wild man. I mean, some people, you recognize that and you, you're impressed. I mean, I have to like gather my forces because of course you have your natural fear, you know, and you have to conquer it. I mean, everybody has something they're afraid of. What are you afraid of? Well, what you're talking about is like wild man. If I wasn't on drugs and I'm out with wild man, wherever it's kicking off, like wild man just goes to it. Everyone else just wants to run away from it. He goes to it. So there's always things happening around him. And I, he was, he loves it, and I'm shitting myself. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't want to be in this situation where you're shitting yourself because you want to be useful. So you have to train yourself. Yeah, the, you can train yourself. You can train courage. So, for example, I have a fear of heights, a natural fear of heights. I really don't like high places that much. But I decided I had to conquer this fear, and so what I did was I started anytime I saw like some creaky old lighthouse with a you know an old metal ladder that went right up to the very top i just climb it even though i hated being there didn't want to do it i'd force myself and after a while you suddenly realize that you you can do it just don't look down too much don't let your mind think about it you can do it and so this is like a it was like a lesson to me you can overcome your fears 
And this is very important for guys because everybody has fears and sometimes it incapacitates them. They just freeze up, be like that punk in that cell who just, you know, his, his life is in front of his eyes and he can't make a move. So being in, inside the prison is very important to be able to, and not, not hesitate. Your, 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 your courage, it has to come up in a surge and everybody has to see it. You can't be hesitating on this. And so, like I said, you, can, you, you put yourself through situations and then you see who you are and you work on your courage. I mean, uh, well, I use drugs to give me that false courage. Like when I sat down with the people who were working for Sammy the Ball, and I was meeting them for the first time, and I knew they, you know, I'd heard of my reputation, but I don't look much, so I'm gonna have to act a bit crazy. As we're sitting down on the sofa, I just grabbed them both above the above the, the knee and made them jump. <laughs> but that was because I was on so many substances. Well, well, I mean, I, you give an important life lesson there because my fear was social anxiety from being a teenager. Being in prison six years sober, living with people constantly at close quarters confronted my fear, just like you confronted your fear. You went up the lighthouse ladder. So if you're out there and you do have a fear, the only way to, to deal with it is to confront it head on. It was for you voluntarily went up the ladder. I, I was picked by an invisible hand to live around people for six years, met some of them were maniacs. You get out of that situation, the world seems safe. You, your social anxiety is way down. So if you do have a fear out there, this is life lessons from John Abbott today. Confront that fear head on. Well, I mean, it's okay. The thing is, is that um, you just have to maintain that balance, right? You can't go over the top. Now, how did you, what drugs did you use which which kept you on the straight and narrow so you didn't go over the top? Because, I mean, with those great dangerous guys, you can make a mistake very easily if you're high, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what it was, crystal meth, my mind was like going 10,000 miles an hour. So it's was, like the I worst was, one, right? In, in the <laughs> beginning, in the beginning, you're hypervigilant. At the end of your crystal meth cycle, you're completely paranoid and completely making mistakes. Completely paranoid, right. I would say that I wasn't chronically addicted to meth like Wildman was. The prosecutor said that. That was her own words. He was just doing it, hammering it constantly. So I just do it on occasion when I needed the energy and I needed. Generally, I'm a party person, just taking my ecstasy, doing my GHB, just, you know, having a laugh. But when there was a situation I needed to be really alert, crystal meth, and I had GHB as well, which would tweak my brain, make me, that would bring the craziness in as well as the alertness in. Well, the trouble with crystal meth, I was, when I got put in the North Block punishment uh, cells after that uh, stabbing in the library, they were doing an investigation. Some of the, some of the fellas sent us some crystal meth. So I was in with this guy called Greg, and he was a quiet guy. And we snorted this crystal meth. And it was almost like, uh, I mean, if there's a drug that you want, you want people to confess to something, give them crystal meth. Because there's this incredible urge you have to just talk. The first time I did it, me and my mate were just telling each other our life stories, exactly. like things we'd never ever told anyone exactly. in our lives. And and like it was a it was a it was a race between whether Greg was going to confess to me or I was going to confess to Greg, <laughs> and I was I was just fighting it, like <laughs> chewing. It, like, stop, don't say a word. Just just keep your teeth clenched, right? And Greg, he, he started telling me the tale. And what a tale it was. This guy, he'd been a fisherman in Astoria working in a salmon plant. And every day he'd wake up and go and sort salmon as it poured down the sluice. The sluice. And it turns out, I learned something from him. It turns out the white, the white meat is sold as salmon, white or red meat. But the dark meat is cat food. And so at that time you could eat cat food if you wanted to because it was just the dark meat of salmon. Nothing wrong with it at all. Anyway, so Greg, Greg was, a, it turned out he was like a professional criminal. Him and a, him and a crew stole, now listen to this, plates from the Denver Mint. You know what plates are? Plates, like pressing plates the for plates currency. The plates currency, for making money. The real plates. If you have the plates, then all you need to do is source the paper. I mean, there's, you don't, there's no need for counterfeiters, right? They actually got hold of plates in a robbery, and they were totally hooked up. 
except the guy who got them hooked up decided that they their usefulness was over and it was time for them to go so he set them up to be wiped out by a gang of chicano gangbangers and they came out of this hotel in denver the gangbangers just opened up on him cut down his two bros he blew one of the, the mexicans away with a shotgun and he said the only reason he was alive was because they were such poor shots that he just ran away and they were blazing over the place like john dillinger and so Greg gets away. Well, Greg knows he was set up, right? No one knew they were there. And sure enough, it had to be the guy who set up the robbery. He was just wanting to, you know. Type loose ends. Yeah, loose ends. And so Greg hunted him down and he, and he caught him. Uh, I don't know if you know California, but there's a main highway that goes up from San Francisco up through the valley into the north through Wairika and Weed and all these places. Anyway, he was driving down the highway and he spotted the guy's car. And so he, the guy's going along and he, he pulls up alongside him with an M16. Trouble is, he's, got a, he's right-handed, so he's got, to fire, he's got to fire over the steering wheel at the guy one-handed and he, and he and botches it, right? Shoots a few holes through, his, through, the, through the car and blasts away. The guy freaks out, steps on it, full speed down the road, and then the guy tries to do a Yui and loses it for some reason, tried to do a Yui, and rolled out, stumbles off into the forest. Now, Greg, his one thing he did, aside from canning salmon, was he was a hunter. <laughs> and he loved to hunt, and he hunted every weekend. Oh, God. And he said he, he came to the side of the road, and he said he could hear this guy floundering around in the, in the bush. So <clears throat> he, he, he looked at the land, and he saw there was a bit of ridge this way. And as hunters, you stay on the ridges, huh? And so he just cut along and he just, as he could, he could listen to this guy crashing through the bush and he just quietly walked along and he came out into a clearing and the guy stumbled out, exhausted, eyes just staring, looking at him, please, please, please. And of course there was no please to it, right? Greg filled him in. And all of this, he told me a complete stranger. We just happened to be at the library at the same time because of this bloody crystal meth, right? <laughs> I mean, but he knew, he knew you'd hold your mud. <laughs> <laughs> well, I held my mud, but you know, I mean, you're taking chances, aren't you? Yeah. Telling stories like that. Yes. So I always wondered what happened to Greg. He just seemed like a good guy. But <laughs> you never would have known that story if you didn't, if you didn't have to be banged up with him, both doing some crystal math, right? Yeah. So we were talking about like false bravery then and um, conditioning yourself to come across as you're in control of the situation to not project weak vibes basically well for me this was more of a problem because i look straight i look white bread straight i look so straight people think i'm a police officer now here's a story which is kind of it's a bit strange um phil said to me you know uh, you do look really straight because we were we went and saw some of the fellas and they were wondering about me right if I was some kind of FBI agent and you know in undercover right <laughs> and Phil vouched for me and I said well let's let's see if we can parlay this into some advantage he said what do you mean I said well let's go down to the to the police headquarters in San Francisco and this was before the days of computer records everything was in paper files I said, let's just walk up to the detective floor, see if we can get in there, and just look ourselves up and see what's on the files. <laughs> <laughs> he says, okay. He said, we'll do it. <sighs> so Phil was up for anything, right? So we went to the went to the main entrance, and they had, you know, the metal detectors and the guards checking things. But on the far left part was an open area, and there were police lounging around there, guys, officers. And they were there. And I noticed the guys were just, the police officers were just walking through. Like they were recognized. They were policemen. They just walked through. They didn't have to go through the metal detector and the check. So I said to Phil, I said, let's just walk through there. I said, you're the older cop, white. I'm the younger cop, straight. And we did. We just walked right through. Nobody even said a word. Nobody even glanced at us, right? You know? I mean, because 
you know, there's no spider tattoo on my head and there's no, you know, fuck you in my hands and, you know, don't, I'm not carrying yourself like a vato loco, right? <laughs> so we, we're inside the police, walking along. We go up to the detective floor. And, you know, I think we're, this, this just my work, right? Talk about stealing meat from lions. <laughs> <laughs> so we walk down the hallways and then who comes out? Bloody Neil Jordan, who is the detective who is investigating us. And he just, his eyes go big like this. He thought we could have shoot him or something, right? He's just looking. He's like, oh, 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 what are you doing here? I said, we just came up here to see you, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't tell him what we were really doing, right? So. What was his reaction to that? Well, he was stunned, but of course, it's not illegal, is it, to yeah. visit the police department? Yeah, that's true. There's a whole um, thing going up and down the country right now, people called auditors, who are just showing up at police departments and walking in with cameras and filming. And the police all come running out and say, you can't do this. And then they say, well, we can do this. Um, this is my tax money paying for this. And there's all these big altercations happening on these police stations. That's it's, right. There's that. It's going really viral, that stuff. Yeah, there's that fellow with the British, uh, well, he was right winger, what's his name? He always shows up for those. I forgot his name. I can't remember either. He's been arrested a few times. But uh, yeah, that was back in the days when things weren't on computer and you didn't need passwords. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was, a, it was a problem looking straight because um, it, was, it was good and it was bad. Here's an example of where it was good. Um, one day Phil says to me that... Um, he says, I'm, I got to go see this NF, this Nestor General, Nostra Familia General. I said, really? What for? He says, ah, oh, you know, there's a deal maybe there. And I said, well, you ain't going alone, brother. I mean, those boys are as twisty as a bucket full of snakes, right? But you see, Phil didn't look at things that way. He'd go walk into any situation by himself. He wasn't bothered. And so I said, we'll follow you along and see, see how it goes. So I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how this is going to shake out, right? So I decided to take along my guitar case with the AR-15 in it just to make sure I'm in command situation, right? So Phil goes over, and he's supposed to meet the guy at a time at a, on a certain corner in San Francisco. And, the, and somebody's there, and he's talking to this fellow. But I look over, and there are two cholos just leaning up against the wall with the attitude, right? Two, two skinny little Mexican, I mean Chicanos. And they might as well just be broadcasting, I'm a criminal and I probably got a gun in my belt, right? And they're right on the street. I spot them. Now I'm wearing a, a Stanford University t-shirt, right? And Harold is with me, is, is wearing one. He loved these uh, Hawaiian t-shirts, uh, <laughs> shirts with the bright colors. So we look like a couple of tourists. <laughs> anyway, so Phil's walking along with this general, the Nuestra Familia general. And they get into this mobile home, this RV that was parked there. And Phil sits in the front with the guy. And then these two cholos come and they open the door and like sit right behind the two of them. So there's three of them all around him. And then I said, well, here's our turn to make our move. So I just open the door too and get in, flip the case on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the guitar case so it's, it's open. And just stand there, and and uh, Harold uh, stands behind them too. Ooh, and all of a sudden, I don't know what they had planned, but whatever it was, they decided it was time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, Holy shit. Uh, I don't like I said, I wasn't in on what 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 the deal was supposed to be, but I have a feeling they wanted to take Phil down, and for whatever reason, he used to deal with them in Vacaville because Vacaville is, was a NF prison. Nuestra Familia prison. Probably still is. If So, that's my only experience with the Nuestra Familia. I think a reoccurring theme from your stories is using a display of force as a deterrent rather than it escalating into yes. a full bloody massacre. Yes. You see, unlike Hollywood, if you're a robber, you don't want to shoot anybody. You don't want guns going off. You don't even want to, uh, any of that drama. The idea of ro robbery is intimidation. Your intimidation is so strong, everybody sh gets shocked and stays still and you do what you want. That's how you want it to go down. But in Hollywood, that's not exciting enough. They always want shootouts. They want 
people shot. They want, you know, teeth knocked out, right? That's that's almost, uh, you know, what's a dopamine jolt every, you know, five minutes or something. But if you're a real robber, you don't want any of that. In crime, you don't want drama. You want it to go down smooth and as silks, nicely. Even best if they don't even know they've been robbed. So, uh, I have a feeling sometimes in the comments people make, they, they sort of expect the Hollywood stuff. Whereas in my stories, like I said, it, the idea is not to do that. But saying that, John has been in two full-scale shootouts <laughs> with the cops, with people dying all around him and almost dying himself. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's just the trouble. when you, Where they say, live by the sword, die by the sword. Once, once you pull the gun, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean... I mean, just a SWAT team coming in and fanning out was a funny time warp thing in, on my head. To be in an active shootout twice... Does time do something crazy when you people dying around you? Bullets flying? Well, you don't even notice the bullets because if they don't hit you, there's nothing to think about, right? But hearing the, do you hear a noise? The well, guns yeah, you hear the noise, out. but it's a noise, and there's a lot of noise, right? So, <laughs> you know, the the rule is for me. It's not like the Matrix. You're trying to dodge bullets. <laughs> it, well, the rule is for me pretty simple. If they don't know who you are, go for it. If they do know who you are, don't. Okay. What that means is if they come to your house like they came to your house, you give it up because they know who you are. They got all the guns. You're just going to get yourself killed. And if you don't get killed, you'll be all day in prison. So you give it up. But if you're doing a robbery like we were, my brother and I, I mean, at that burglary, and they come and they don't know who you are, blaze away because you're going to put the scare of God in them. And hopefully you'll get away from it. Just, just they'll get go into shock. Or they'll be calling on radio, and you'll slip away. So that's the uh, the basic kind of rule as far as that's concerned. Right? Sega Frog, can you ask John Abbott if he's ever considered pursuing an acting career? Because he seems like someone who would be brilliant on screen. Imagine him in something like Breaking Bad, for example. <laughs> He would have easily fitted right into a show like that. Well, if you're lucky. Do you remember um, Reservoir Dogs? Oh, yeah, you would fit in that. Do you remember um, Bunker? Edward Bunker was in the movie. Are you a tipper? Uh, wasn't he Mr. Blue? I think so. Yeah. He, do, you like, do you like to leave tips? That's the question, huh? <laughs> I, I don't like to leave tips. I was on the other side of that one. <laughs> oh! <laughs> because that American thing with tips is, is unfair, really. Because the restaurant should charge what it costs, and you pay them what it costs. And they, they should pay a wage to their staff that's a good wage, and there's no drama. But that tipping thing leaves this unpleasant drama. It also makes, it makes the, the waiting staff act creepy. Do you know what I mean? They're See, hanging around <laughs> you like buzz flies, right? Just tr tr trying to, to like attract your attention, show how... how how, how much they're uh, serving you and how well I'm they're I'm sorry, doing. John, but I'm on the other side in Reservoir. I came from America back to the UK after 16, 17 years where the customer service is shit and nobody's tipping. And I was thinking, if these guys got tips, they would be kissing my ass right now and it, it would be a much more pleasant experience. Oh, I see. I, I, I spent some time in Japan and there's no tipping in Japan. And the service is excellent. The Japanese, everything they do, they do it to an excellence. It's considered, do you know how, the thing in the UK is good enough for is kind of the attitude. Whereas you go to a place like Japan, everything is exactly as how it should be. If a guy tells you he's going to be there at nine o'clock, unlike me today, he's there at 8.57 and he's ready to go at nine o'clock. And he's, the first thing he does isn't start talking to his girlfriend on his cell phone. And sort of, uh, you know, start texting everybody he knows, right? Here in the UK, you get kind of a slipshod attitude about service, right? You're right. But have you not had creepy uh, uh, waitresses and waiters hanging around? Uh? So, as like, all right, as a party person in America on drugs. Oh, well, you're the big man. <laughs> you were the big man throwing money around, right? So, yeah, I, I understand. Okay. <laughs> I prefer the service and the vibe and cracking yeah. jokes with the waiters and the waitresses. 
rather than in England, you're like, you're sat there for 15 minutes and no one's even come to your table and your belly's rumbling. <laughs> yeah, well, you're in, a, you're in a good situation. Was it in those mafia movies? They always give a C note to everybody in the- I wasn't that the, generous. Yeah. Oh, I was an over tipper, but not that generous. Yeah, so I mean, sure, that would get you good service. Absolutely. So to Reservoir of Dogs fans watching this video, please let us know in the comments, are you a tipper or are you not a tipper? And let us know why. Big difference between the American and the UK cultures when it comes to tipping. But that, it was a hilarious scene. Well, in that I, I got spoiled because I was, I was in San Francisco with my girlfriend at a, at a restaurant. And the waiter was gay. And as the meal was going on, the guy was hanging around me all the time, trying to flirt with me in front of my girlfriend. Well, that's, um, now, that's a, a compliment, isn't it? Well, I didn't take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I did when it happened to me at the gay bar. <laughs> I mean, if you went to a gay bar, then you're up for that, right? But I was with my girlfriend, right? Yeah. And so at the end of this, you know, I, I expressly didn't leave him a tip because of what he did, because I thought it was over the top and rude. And the guy had the balls to chase me out of the restaurant, out on the street and say, why didn't you give me a tip? And I said to him, I said, this is my girlfriend and you were trying to come on to me while I was eating. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he just looked stunned, like, what? Like, what? You'd rather be with a woman? <laughs> Times have changed, John. Times have changed. Oh, dear. So, so that, I guess but that might have gone, soured yeah, it. It's a controversial yeah. subject on, on YouTube. Yeah. We've had to take a few videos down on, on these subjects. Um, but yeah, let us know in the comments. Are you a tipper? Are you not a tipper? What, put in the comments, what, what you, you think, the ideal movie or TV series, John Abbott would, should have fitted in, would have fitted in, would be brilliant. Let us know. I love reading those comments. Well, be a good that's, laugh. that's what I was saying. So they put Edward Bunker in there because, well, he's the crime writer and he's convict who'd been done all the prisons. And he was like the advisor for the film. So he got a role and he was in it. And he, he gave, gave a bit of, and there's that movie Snatch. There's another one. Do you remember that big beast? Too? Who works uh, for the hatchet, dunking people's heads in the James water? James knows all the people in Snatch. Lenny McClain. The big, yeah, Lenny the big McClain. thug. He, no. yeah, the guy. He's 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 a, he's a crim, a real one, and he's got the the feeling about it, you know. So, were you in? Did you do ever ever do time with Ed Bunker? No, he was uh, when he he was in like the he'd have been about ten years before me. He'd have been about like the early seventies, late sixties. But I certainly have read its books, and I, they're a good read for me because it fits right into the world as I saw it. Whereas the stuff now, one of the things I catch in the, in the comments is guys don't understand um, what I was talking about when I say little guys are dangerous. Because now, because there are no weapons around, or there are very few good weapons, the big guys have the hand, right? Because if you're naturally big, then you can just beat people up. I wouldn't say there's no weapons around. Where well, I, I'd say what comparatively, I you're not going to yeah. be able to pull out swords. There's no weights and things like yeah, that. I mean, there were weight bars. There were swords that these Japanese oh, yeah, used changed, to make in, changed, the, in, the, yeah. in the metal yeah. shop. I mean, even in Canada, i give you a sense of it. At Kent, maximum, where I was, the dining room was in one corner of the quad. And next to the dining room was the metal shop. And in the dining room, they had stainless steel cutlery including nice stainless steel knives. Of course, they were rounded, and you would just palm one of the stainless steel knives, give it to my man Kirk in the uh, metal shop, and he would just grind it into a perfect blade. And so I had this shank, about that long it had been, uh, and I kept it inside the broom, you know? You have the broom, and you slip it, stuff it down. You know how those, they, those tie together about this long to yeah. sweep out your cell, and you put it right in? I mean, you got to put it somewhere. So they actually had a metal shop right beside the dining room that supplied you with stainless steel knives. So it wasn't a problem getting weapons wow. in Kent. But when the fellas comment on things now, they wonder, well, you know, 
where where are they getting all these weapons and how come they got such good weapons and you know this was 25 years ago the 70s wasn't it mm, more than that all right so next one is from martin p i would like to know what is john's opinion on open university or other forms of education for people who want to change lifestyle career life any tips recommendations will be appreciated well i would recommend that open university take their courses into the prison and actually do the classes inside the prison because there's only a certain few who are self-motivated to arrange the open university courses by themselves but if the courses actually come into the prison a lot more people will go just because it's something to do and they might find they like it i don't know what what they do in the british system but from the sounds of it particularly with this uh, virus stuff people are locked up uh, what 23 hours a day or something so uh, it would be exactly the right time to be bringing in courses yeah definitely and you might notice that a lot of prisoners are not stupid um i ran into a fair few who are dyslexic like Phil was dyslexic. And people who are dyslexic suffer a real problem in school because everybody thinks they're thick because they can't read or they can't write very well. And so they get a they get grumpy about that. They get a chip on their shoulder. And a lot of the times they go down the they go down the dark way. But they're not stupid. And so they actually make very good criminals because they're not just mindless thugs. And that's an example of of how um, when people end up in prison, they have all this time on their hands, and then these get these are the the guys who suddenly decide that you know that maybe they should learn how to read better and how to write, and so they want to take courses. And I think that fellow Thompson, uh, Mike Thompson, got a degree, a PhD, in something. Yeah, and it's really sad because we heard from Pepsi Watson, who's in prison again, one of our first podcast guests. And he said all the lockdowns and everything, people are just self-harming and what, some guy cut his ear off and all this shit and they've got nothing to do. Educate them. There's yeah. so many, so much wasted talent in prison. Yeah. And, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I, I took a gemology course while I was in Canadian prison. The Gemology, gemology Institute of America. And they, would, they sent me textbooks. I had to pay for it myself. But they sent me the textbooks, and then they would send me, this is really interesting, they would send me 20 stones a week. And the stones had no name or list or anything on them. And I had to run my tests with the specific uh, gravity fluids and the spectrometer and this and that, and identify what these stones were. And some of them might be plastic, some of them might be, you know, cubic zirconia, some might be, who knows. And so I did that for like six months and got my gemologist certificate. And so um, it was a kind of a niche thing that you would never do in, you know, outside where you're, you're busy. But in prison, you got the time. And so it was really interesting. And it actually worked out because I, um, there's a great story about the Unreal Gem Company in Bangkok. <laughs> You haven't watched this uh, <laughs> series that's popular right now called The Serpent, have you? No. He, he's a gem. Oh, that, that guy. Yeah, I gem remember trader. him. Yeah. He was the serial killer, wasn't he? Yeah, he's, yeah. he's back. He's in prison now in what, is is it, Kathmandu or somewhere. Is he still alive? He got, I don't want to spoil the end of it, but um, he got away with it basically and then wanted to get back in the limelight and ended up. Well, he got away with it because he was he was knocking off tour, uh, like uh, hippie travelers Yeah, who... In those days, people didn't have cell phones and they weren't texting mom every other day, right? No. They'd disappear for six months and go to Kathmandu or Cambodia or wherever it was. And then they'd come back emaciated with dysentery and mom would take care of them. But sometimes they didn't come back. And this is where, you know, he was able to, to, to do it. And he had some girl who was enticing was, was a serial and, killer couple, yeah. him and the girl. Yeah. And they had a third killer that yeah. was assisting them. Yeah. That's what's so fascinating about it was the dynamic between the three. And also the method they used, like he would put something in the drink. Then they would say they were sick. And then he'd be like, here's your medicine. And make them increasingly sicker and sicker and sicker. 
Well, I mean, when I was in the Philippines in Manila, uh, there was a Japanese tourist, and he'd been in the park, right in the city park in the center of the t city, and a girl came up to him and started chatting him up. And he was really pleased because a, a lot of Japanese guys, that's the reason they go to the Philippines is to chat up young girls. And so, you know, she said, well, I want an orange juice. Do you want one? And he said, yeah. So she ran over and got him two orange juices. And he woke up two days later naked in the ditch. They even took his underwear. And that was from, that's like in the center city park in Manila. It's lucky he was alive. Well, or he, they didn't harvest one of his kidneys, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's just run of the mill in the old Philippines. Next question is from Blaze Furchild. I would like to know what, um, did... You, do you feel you have to work twice as hard at a job or something else to save enough for retirement after not being able to work for so many years of criminality? Well, this is one thing. Um, you probably have the same problem. I have no pension. Like, I'm a UK citizen, but I've never worked here. So I have no, what's it called, national insurance savings. I have no pension. And I don't know if you have one either. And I don't know if any prisoners have pensions. Probably not. So what happens when prisoners get older? They've they, got to give you something, haven't they? they? You just live on the dole or? <laughs> I'm not sure either. I'd have to research I mean, that. you're hustling, so you're, you're covered. Because I mean. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Don't lose it. And I, I've done my, my hard graft and, and I'm sort of coasting along and, um, you know. I think they take some out of your taxes, don't they? And you get something. Do you? I think so. Well, this is a big issue because in America, about three quarters of those homeless people are ex-convicts just on the street. You know, they, they've finished with their $50 that the state gives them and then they're, you know, then what do they do? Right? You're saying I can't claim a pension for my fake social security Nazi <laughs> number I used working illegally in America. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you probably could. <laughs> So this this is an issue because uh, unless you're, um, I mean, how how many convicts actually have anything saved? Do you think? No, that's what I'd not say. Many. Almost none. Not many. They just live by the seat of the pants. I mean, because it's hard enough, even even as a normal citizen, to get good jobs and keep them. Let alone. Sadly, everything went into just getting your next fix where I was housed in the state, in Arizona State, and then I would say about 90%, it was just all spent on drugs. Well, your man Kane there, how's he doing? Did he, has he got a job or is he just- Yeah, so Jamie Morgan Kane, our very first podcast guest, controversial, there was a lot of blowback on what he said. I sent him over to Mirror Group Books. He took hundreds of pages of paperwork to Mirror Group Books. They validated his story. His first book has become a bestseller and he's just got a second deal with them now. He's going to have a second book published. We took him to the Isle of Man. He loved it. Uh, it, it it's his spiritual home. And I, I believe Jamie wants to move there at some point. So, you know, he, he didn't know anyone. He didn't have anything. Ended up living with a woman who was a pen pal for prisoners abroad. That's still his situation, we believe. Good. Um, but because of these books, you know, people think people get a, a book and it's a good seller that they're instantly rich. It's not. It's it's a slow grind, but he has got some resources from these books now. And he's, he's, well, he's, once he's, you get one done, it's, it becomes easier to do another, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's really good. I'm really glad you were able to help him like that because- uh, He was loving it on the island, man. You could see the light in his eyes when he was speaking to the people. And it, his story just really resonated with all the locals. Well, James, what, what was he like on the Isle of Man, Jamie? I enjoyed his time. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, because I mean, you made that happen for it, basically. So yeah, we helped him along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, that was a real. Well, success. I feel blessed that we've got this platform that's so big. That it's it's the love and support from the viewers, really. People reaching out. And helping people like Pepsi Watson, I mentioned he did get recalled, but a viewer of his podcast reached out to him 
and helped him relocate to London and build his own podcast studio and everything. Good. Yeah. Yeah, because he was successful too at this, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Next question from Disco Stew. Is John living a happy life now? Well, I can't complain. I mean, <laughs> it'd be nice if I was 30 years younger, right? But uh, <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> You're still shit hot on the badminton court, though, apparently. We're hearing rumors. Oh, I, I do all right on the badminton <laughs> court still. It, it, the trouble is, as you get older, it's not that you can't do it. It's the recovery time afterwards. Mm. So that's the only difference, right? Last night, I went jogging for the first time with my neighbor who's in his 20s. He says, look, I'm going to have a jog at 10 o'clock at night. Do you want to come with me? I'm like, yeah, you know, I go jogging every now and then in the sun at my own pace. And he was like a greyhound. Literally, it was all uphill for the first five or 10 minutes. And the distance between us was expanding and expanding <laughs> and expanding. And I, I was like, my breath and everything was just going crazy. I was, like, I, I was almost at the point where I was going to like just quit. I just pushed through. He stopped at the end of the road and just did a trot on the spot and waited for me. And um, I did manage to get it. He says it usually takes him about 25 minutes to do the whole thing. With me, I think it took about 40 minutes for us to do the whole thing. But I felt great this morning when I woke up after yeah. pushing myself through yeah. that. Yeah, look, well, keep in mind that for about 99% of the life of the human species, you'd be dead at this age. Yeah. I mean, 40, 45 years old was about the best you could expect. In, in centuries gone by. Yeah. 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 So actually, both of us would be well in the ground. These two gents look like they'd still be around, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this one then is getting in, into the more of the hardcore stuff. It's from Neo Meister. John, your take on predation is very interesting. In your latest podcast, you talked about when you took the cigarettes from a guy in prison, justifying it by saying he tried to hide them, which showed weakness. I understand this behavior in a prison environment, but where do you draw the line? I think predation can benefit the weak by making them stronger after the fact, teaching them, but where is the line in your opinion? You seem like a man whose moral compass is intact. Well, I mean, in terms of morality, I, I have a kind of tit for tat attitude. So if you treat me respectfully and politely, then I'll treat you respectfully and politely. But if you come off you know, with aggression and insults, you'll catch that's the exact same back. Now, that's at odds with our Christian background. You know, we, we, we grow up learning an absolute code, you know, the Ten Commandments, and what you, you're not supposed to lie, and you're not supposed to cheat, and you're not supposed to steal. But the fact of the matter is that lying, cheating, and stealing is actually a, is, is a very successful way of getting ahead, right? <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see what goes on in the city, you know, uh, uh -huh. in any big city, New York, London, wherever, um, lots of people do it and do very well at it. Including the people running the country. <laughs> yeah, and so, it, you know, you have to be realistic. So, you ha in Japan, they have a situational ethics, which is very interesting. So... For example, right now, the Japanese are very peaceful people, and they love anime, and they love little girls and cuteness. But, you know, you, you, you go backwards a few decades, and uh, they were the most ruthless, uh, you know, dogs on the planet. They killed far more Chinese than Hitler killed anybody. I mean, Hitler was good for about 6 million. The Japanese killed about 20 million Chinese during the war. And the experiments in the... And places, the, out, yeah. the outrageous stuff. Yeah, I read and about that, yeah. It, and they have, an, they have an expression, when nobody knows you, you can do what you want. So what that means is if you live in your village where everybody knows everybody, you police each other. You don't need a police force because everybody's watching you and everybody is on you. And so this is how a village maintains its law and order. It's not that the police are going to show up because they don't usually have one. But if you go to some place where nobody knows you, then you're just free to run amok, right? And so it, we, we are sort of stuck with this hardcore Christian ethics, and th this causes all kinds of problems. For example, you know, marriage is supposed to be till death do you part, except that, well, 50% of them divorce, right? And then cheat on each other and all the rest of it. So this causes problems for us. If we had a more relaxed view, more of a situational view, then we wouldn't get so much stress and anxiety and people wouldn't be so, what, flagellating themselves because of the way they are. 
Nietzsche said, all the laws we impose upon our own society, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, we reverse when it comes to other societies. <laughs> well, it, you know, it works. This is the thing. So as far as stealing the fellow cigarettes, the reason I really did it was because I wanted to improve my status with uh, Doug Orr, the man, right? <laughs> and it, and That's it your most out. viral clip. It's... Um, what was it called now? The Hell's Angel Assassin in San Quentin Prison or something? Well, I don't think that the Hell's Angel members who've, who wrote comments, I don't think they're very happy with that expression. They did make us make some adjustments to the thumbnail. Yeah, because um, they wouldn't see themselves that way. The, the, the word assassin suggests that you do it professionally, whereas they wouldn't be doing it professionally. Any, everything they do would be for the club. And when you frame it like that, you look at it differently. You're doing it for your bros, right? It makes it far more palatable, put it that way. Fifi Lamour, love listening to John. He's one hard man. With each interview, he's a he, he's nice, he's softer and nicer to see. My question for both men is, um, is it, this is for you, sorry. Do you have nightmares about anything you have done or seen? If so, how do you deal with it now? Thanks, Fifi. Now, this is, this is an interesting point. And I wonder because that thing in the library where the BGF tried to knife me, I've never had a dream about that. I've never, it happened so fast and, you know, it just didn't impact me the same way. I sometimes have dreams that I'm back in prison and you know i've messed up somehow and i've got to deal with it but no I, I don't have dreams about specific incidents what about the shootouts narrow one ne never had a dream about that so when you when i hear about people for example soldiers are often in the U, in the uk news talking about flashbacks and all this drama about things they saw and i went through the same kind of stuff and i've never never had that kind of trouble at all. I get a good night's sleep. Immediately when you came out of prison, did you not have some of that stuff, like flashbacks and uh, nightmares and things? Uh, not nightmares. I, I often have really good dreams. You know, strange women I don't even know suddenly are very keen and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I quite enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads on to the next question from JC. Is John single, smiley face? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you'd say that. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the, yeah, um, this is a big one though, that, that one about nightmares and dreams because it's, it's what, where are you on the dream thing? For example, Native Indians used to believe that, that dreaming was a reverse side of reality and it was actually, you could see things that you were going to do or you might, be, or situations you might be in. And they would they would name themselves based on things they saw in their dreams. So if you saw a running buffalo, then you might name yourself running buffalo. So for them, dreams had meaning. How do you feel on that? So I've gone through various stages of dreams in my life, whereby once I got on drugs, my dreams were drastically altered. I had some really intense situations in dreams. Then I'm sober in jail, but I'm still having dreams of being hunted by the cops. Then I'm out of jail and prison and having dreams I'm still in jail and prison mixed with getting hunted by the cops and dreams from my <laughs> trafficking, drug trafficking days. Oh, dear. But then the flashbacks and the nightmare stuff it's gone way down now because I got released in December 2007. Oh, well, that's been a, been a good whack, yeah. Very rare now I have a prison dream. Well, I still have prison dreams, but uh, they're not particularly bad. They usually, you're, you're in there somewhere and you've got to deal with some problem. Yeah, situation. Yeah. Um, as far as guns and stuff, sometimes I have a dream where the, I get the wrong ammunition and can't put it in the gun. So that's a bit disappointing. And you're about to get shot dead. Actually, more like I'm about to shoot somebody else, right? 
<laughs> Crypto Hippie wants to know what years was John an inmate in San Quentin? So that would be, what would that be, 78, 79, 80? Yeah. Mark's question um, ties into what we're just talking. How do you deal with your stressful past today? I have dreams about very stressful experiences. So, like, I would say for me, yoga, meditation, working out, jogging last night. I slept so deeply after jogging last night yeah, at yeah. a fast rate. Woke up crisp. I, I thoroughly believe, and I've said this in my TED Talks, that the physical changes the mental if you are down in the dumps it's hard to get off the couch and do something physical but you got to shake yourself up and get out there recently the sun's been out you know i've been jogging at my slow pace in the farmer's fields with the sun with my top off and you feel it and you, you, your brain chemistry is completely changed by now, now you've got some good color on your head there <laughs> <laughs> Finally, so, not, so in the past you're always like it's so pale. That's for our <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, no. Well, think about it this way: we we evolved as hunter gatherers on the savanna, and we would just, you know, the expression "seek and ye shall find." Well, that's what we did. We wandered around just looking at things, turning over. Is there a bone? There is. There's there's some beans. Oh, there's a mushroom, and that's what we're body in our mental state was built for so we're at our best when we're in motion doing things so all this sitting around that we do in today's world is 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 novel it's a new experience for the human body and of course it causes problems worst thing you can do is just fall asleep on your sofa to a netflix series and wake up with popcorn in your ass crack. Uh, that kind of lifestyle is just two-thirds of the body's designed for movement ah, isn't it exactly and you'll find that the more I like I like exercise that has uh, an edge to it, right? So that 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 makes me feel alive, and that's who humans are supposed to be. That's what we're supposed that's, to do. That's what right? my jockey friend was like last night. He's like, "We're gonna go in the dark, yes, through trees and paths, yes, and the branches will stir at us, but our adrenaline will spur us on." Yeah. <laughs> he's well, he's like, twenty years old, right? So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my daughter's like that too. She 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 jogs at night, right? And I say, well, do you ever worry about any strange guys jumping out of the woodwork, right? Nah, she's, she's just, you know. Well, that's what I said to him. He said, yeah, the one one night there was a strange guy, and he freaked me out so much. I ran faster than I've ever. <laughs> I was like, All right, then, let's do it. It'd give you good motivation, yeah. Yeah, so we got that one. We got that one. Right, <laughs> Jen. The beak. I'm wondering about John Abbott. What thing, stroke, lesson would John tell to his 20 year old self? Oh, this is a tough one because, you know, your experiences make you who you are. So I feel at this point, not being in prison, I feel better and stronger and. And, you know, I feel adapted to my world. I feel lively. I feel I can do, I can deal with situations. Now, before, if you, if you don't opt to do anything, if you opt for the soft life, then you never really know who you are. And it's a question you're going to be wondering. And at some point, you're going to say, why didn't I go out and just do something and find out who I was? Why did I just sit on the, on the couch, as you say? So for me, I'm glad that I went through what it, I, I really regret my brother died, but I, aside from that, the rest of it, I'm glad I went through it because I feel the stronger person for it. I mean, there was a lot of, there's a lot of sacrifice to make, but that's looking back from right now, looking on it. I'm sure at the time I might've wished <laughs> to uh, have avoided it, but I think that anything that makes you stronger, you're going to be better off in dealing with the, the the trouble that life throws at you. Well, that's going back to the ancient Greek philosophy, isn't it? Mm. Odysseus and foreign adventures and well, hardship. Well, you can see it in today's world. We've become so soft. People have become, for example, in Kabul, like Kabul fell like a rotten mango on the ground, right? Now, all those people who are crying about how my human rights are lost and I, I, I was a young Kabul and I wanted to become, why didn't they pick up a gun? I mean, they wanted to stop the Taliban. 
they just go down to the army, bang on the door and say, give us guns and go out and fight the Taliban. If you want to fight for a modern Afghanistan, they should have fought. There was a whole generation, millions of people. Instead, they just gave it up. So if you're just going to give it up, you've got nothing to complain about. You know, liberty, what did Thomas Jefferson say? The, the tree of liberty has to be uh, fertilized with blood every generation. M. Ray Lewis wants to know, please ask John how proficient his Japanese is today and if he speaks any other languages. Well, I mean, I grew up in Canada, so that French is actually a national language. So we had to study it for eight years. But, you know, we're on the West Coast. We weren't too keen on the French or Quebec, so uh, I, I'd say it was more formal than it was, uh, you know, useful. Uh, I like Spanish. That's a good language. Como estas esta tarde? Yeah, and I could certainly swear at you nicely. Pinche <laughs> cabrón. Pendejo. Yeah. So, and Japanese is, yeah, Japanese is pretty good. I used to, uh, well, put it this way. Um, hmm. I once, how's this go? My girlfriend uh, was getting treatment for cancer at the hospital. And she parked her bicycle next to this taxi cab company. And the taxi cab company guy came out. He was tired of these bicycles being parked. And he grabbed, took them all off the railing. I chopped them all off and dumped them in a great big pile. So when she came back from her treatment, she couldn't get her bicycle because it was under about 10 bikes. And so she told me about this. So I went down to the taxi cab company. After I got her bike out, and I sent her home, I said, now you go home on the bike and leave the rest to me. Oh, God. So I went down to the taxi cab company, and I walked in, and I said, there was a girl on the desk, and I said, uh, uh, you know, like, who piled all the bikes up? She said, I don't know, just kind of gave me the brush off. And I said, no, no, I really want to know who piled the bikes off. So... She said, I just went back to her work. So I went, Uso da hakujo! And I just took my hand and everything on the desk flew across the table, the, the, all the files, everything they had went, crashed on the wall, bam, bam, bam. She looked at me with one go, she said, Suzuki da, Suzuki! I said, where's Suzuki? She said, he's in the garage, he's in the garage. So I walked in and uh, I pinned Suzuki against the wall and you know, gave him the message. And, but the thing is, I was using these expressions that I'd seen in Yakuza movies, right? Because, of course, when I studied Japanese, it was always very polite, you know? It was all kudasai masenka, you know, very polite sort of grandma Japanese, right? That you learn in school. So uh, if you want to pick up some good expressions, watch some Yakuza movies, right? Anyway, it worked like a charm. She got the message, right? Suzuki got the message. So... And is there any truth to the media stories that you have been trained in Japanese martial arts? I'm not really, I tell you, I'm not really interested that much in martial arts. And the reason is, um, where I used to live, there's an Aikido dojo, an old style Aikido dojo run by some, this hardcore purist, old Japanese guy. And he would have them up. And m most of the, uh, the guys studying Aikido were whites, like from France, Belgium, Canada, US, England. The Japanese might go on the weekends to fuss around a bit, but the serious guys were all uh, gaijin, foreigners. And he'd wake them up at five o'clock in the morning and they had to run up to the top of the mountain and back. And then it was all day, hip throws, you know, ankle throws, up and down, bang, 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 bang. And I lived there and so these guys would come and the guy'd stay about five years and then dislocate his back his knees would go out on him, uh, his, his hips would go, um, his, his ankles would go, and they, these guys would fly back to their country damaged. Because the problem with martial arts is, if you train with somebody, I throw you, I have to let you throw me. So your body crashes onto the wooden floor or to the hard mat, bang, and then my body crashes on. And this goes on for day after day, month after month. Now, we're like 
we, we're, we have biomechanical parts and they have a lifetime of so many crashes to the floor, so many kilometers run, so many, so much activity done, and then you start wearing out your parts. And so all of this hardcore martial arts training just prematurely ages people. Now, I want to know how to hit you hard in the head and knock you down, but I don't want you hitting me in the head. So the idea of karate, where, you let, where I let you hit me, or I have to be your training dummy, doesn't make any sense. So I want to know how I can hurt you as, as effectively as possible, and you don't get a lick in on me. That's my idea of a successful fight. I felt that doing karate, all the crash uh, landings and broken fingers and toes and cracked ribs and stuff, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, realize when those guys get older who are really hardcore, they're going to have arthritis. Well, you just, just take a look at the boxers. Every famous boxer is punchy, right? Uh, it's pathetic because each shot to the head is worth about 10,000 brain cells. <sighs> Just, and now, have you been following the, the, the news? Now the rugby players, they find that not just getting hit in the head, but just the average tackling in a rugby game, they're finding that dementia is happening 10, 15 years earlier from all the shocks. Well, that's why a lot of these tough guys are showing up to yoga classes in their old age. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to be able to go the distance with the body that I, that I you know, was given. And that meant avoiding getting smashed up in training. So I've, I've studied some stuff, but I stay away from the hardcore training just for that reason. Yeah. But the thing is, in martial arts, you've got to learn to get hit, haven't you? If you don't know how to get hit, if you're afraid, you, you're going to... Well, my idea is don't get hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a story for you. Here's a story for you. So... When I, do you remember I told you uh, that I had, I walked past a dead body in the street in Oakland when I was at the Volunteers of America halfway house and had to go to the bus stop to go to my job in San Francisco. And I thought to myself, this is a dangerous place. I need a gun. So I want to, if I'm going to be in some Oakland ghetto, I want to be packing. So back at the hotel, there were these kind of uh, drug addicts and such like milling around and there was this one girl she was there pretty often i said to her you know if you see a gun around let me know i didn't think much of it and a few days later she comes to the office and she says well i've got a line on a gun for you i said well where is it i thought she might have it in her bag i give her 50 bucks or something she said no it's down in it's in this hotel room down in the tenderloin she said, there's a guy waving a gun around, frightening people. So. One way to get a gun. <laughs> I said, okay, well, just take me down there. Because I felt, because I'd, I'd said to her, well, you know, can you find a gun? And she'd found one. I, I was obliged to, like, follow it up, right? <laughs> so she took me down to this residency hotel, another, another sort of, you know, junk hotel, like the one we were running. And we go up on the third floor and she knocks on the door and then steps away into this kind of hallway. And I'm standing there and the door opens and the guy, this guy's got a chain on the door and he looks at me. It's a black guy. Oh, he might've been 40 or something, looks at me and he's got a gun in his hand and he says, fuck off white man. Right? So I just, I looked at him and I stepped back and I booted the door right on the chain. You know, the chain is here and I put the boot right here. Bam! The door snaps open, catches him in the face. He goes down, but he had a whole bag of pharmaceutical pills in his hands. And that goes all over the place, bouncing pills. And then the most amazing thing happened. I don't know where they came from, but about six dope fiends came like roaches from under the, under the wainscoting. <laughs> And they run into the room and they're pushing and fighting for these pills and grabbing them. Most of them are women, about four women and two guys, right? <laughs> and I'm standing there and they're fighting for the pills, running around, they're bouncing and scraping on the floor and the guy's out cold. I scooped the gun and it was, uh, it was a good day's work, right? <laughs> I mean, 
she, she'd worked out a sort of a woman's way of getting, uh, getting what she wanted. <laughs> And I got what I wanted. By the way, that's not one of my drug robbing drug dealer stories. Right? <laughs> the, the. Diego Sanchez, mm. greetings from Germany. John, have you ever considered to write a movie script or do a Netflix doc about your life in prison? And do you ever, have you seen the movie Shot Caller? How accurate is Hollywood about the life in prison? Well, that that movie is based on the more modern stuff, isn't it? Industrial prisons with Could, supermax facilities. Yeah. Do you remember your friend Wildman said that he really liked Shot Caller? Yeah, yeah. See, for me, I, I had a criticism at the beginning, and actually there's a guy, uh, an American uh, guy who does podcasts and f from federal prison. He had the same comment to make, that just because somebody got into a fist fight with a black guy would not make him a recruit for the AB. You know, you'd have to earn your bones a bit more seriously than that, right? So that was my, but otherwise the atmosphere was, uh, it was, it was all right. I enjoyed some of the, the parts, you know. What would you have to do to make your bones to qualify for the AB then that shot collar missed? What should it have, you'd have shown? To, you have to put your knife into somebody. You have to go with the boys. Get blood on your steel. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's the only way. And you have to, in fact, you have to be the first man in. They'll make sure you're the first man in to see who you are. You can't be hanging back on the door, right? And does that just make you a prospect? Well, no. If you if you go in and put someone down, then you'll get you'll get into the brand patched. Yeah, full. Yeah, if you, especially if it's a death ring, right? because that's that's the game. This is the thing they they wanted the kills, the AB, and this is the this is why they got banged out forever, and why they did forty five years in prison, and people like myself and Phil who did business on the line and also ran in on people with knives, didn't get the time and didn't, and actually got out of prison because we didn't kill people. We didn't stab them all the time. That's the difference. So in Shot Call, I can't remember. I enjoyed the action. How fast did he become an AB? Was it instant? <sighs> Pretty close. I mean, it didn't, he, he just seemed to be, it was like a fast track to the top. Now, why would you trust a stockbroker? <laughs> I think they stole some of my <laughs> stories, to be honest. Plagiarism. I mean, a stockbroker, right? a lawyer would be just as bad, right? Can you yeah. Imagine? No, I mean, the guys that go into the AB are working class. They're from like uh, this car system and stuff, aren't yeah, they? And they're, they're most, nearly state all of them raised, are state young raised. Offenders. They went through youth authority. They were in group homes, youth authority. And then they went to Tracy and they, they earned their bones. I mean, I could see it in the guys who are in our crew. They just, they knew all the moves. Like, I didn't have to tell them anything. The guy instantly covered my back when we ran in on that guy. The Another guy's going to run run sort of confusion on the guard. These guys knew all the moves. I, there was no, you didn't have to tell them anything. They were professional convicts because they've been doing it all their lives from 11 or 12 years old. Now, this is, those are the kind of guys are going to end up in the AB. People like me, college students, lawyers, stockbrokers are not going to end up in the AB. It's just not going to be in their frame of reference, right? I agree. Um, tying, tying into another movie now, we might have to make this the last question because we've um, started a bit late. David Arthur, my, my question is, do you know the scene in Goodfellas at the end of the movie when he goes outside to pick up a newspaper in his dressing gown and he's lamenting that he's just an everyday schmuck now. <laughs> Are you happy with life on the straight and narrow now? Or like Henry Hill, do you ever yearn a bit for the glory days? Well, I mean, I liked the excitement. I did. I mean, it was exhilarating. So I had no problem with the exciting parts. But the thing is, once you've established a serious record, there's no more, you know, first time offender, there's no breaks, there's no, you're going to get banged out forever. So the, the downside is so big that you just can't do it. So you have to find a way to get the buzz without um, being illegal, right? Like beating me at badminton would not give you well, the buzz. Well, I'd like to, but you never, you never come to the... Uh, 
been to elusive. record, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never come to court. That's a double entendre. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion, John, to the people, to your followers, your supporters, these people? Now you've got this. Uh, you've basically got a fan club that's grown around all these videos. Well, I, I, the one thing I want to say is that my motivation for being here, it's, um, it's a bit different. In your case, this is your career. You're, this is your hustle. You make money on it and you're doing a good job. But I'm not making any money on this and I don't do it for that reason. That's one thing. The second one is I'm not doing it to try and make myself look the big criminal. Actually, I was in many ways a shit criminal, right? I got set off alarms, uh, got into gunfights where people got killed. So that's not it either. But I do feel the job, one of the jobs of older men who've been through experience is to pass on their wisdom, their knowledge, their experience to the new generation. Now, in our world, that's kind of disappeared in a way because the old people don't know anything about TikTok and Instagram and the Japanese anime and all this stuff. And so they seem behind the curve and, and useless and out of, out of whack. But this stuff, this stuff we do know. And this is, this is wisdom that people can really pick up on and might mean something to them seriously if they end up inside. So it's more an elder of the tribe passing on the information. That's more my motivation. Well, that is a noble thing to do. And I can see some clips from this going on TikTok. We can have John Abbott, San Quentin, ex-con on Shot Caller, on Goodfellas, etc. Well, and Good Goodfellas is a good movie because it shows you how ruthless those guys. Do you remember Joe Pesci plays that, that psycho who just oh, shoots the waiter? Brilliant role that was. Shoots the waiter in the foot. Just for fun. Yeah. Now, this is the problem with those kind of guys. They're like, I wouldn't call them rabid dogs, but um, they're dangerous people. And so you kind of have to watch them all the time. So that world, that's the problem. The quality of people you run into is the problem. I mean, if I had one complaint about being a criminal, it's the poor quality of people you run into. Loose cannons. Yeah people who are damaged and you know they don't think the right way they 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 see things the wrong way they their tendency to get paranoid and twisted about stuff and if they don't burn out they take everyone down around them yeah there's there's that too so that's one of the problems you know what do they say it's always hard to get good help yeah yeah because the well adjusted people don't usually choose crime <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, as, the, as their career and i was blessed to have wildman who still protects me from above and we do have a tiktok account now so the link will be in the description box and we've got an odyssey account we are ever expanding um we will hopefully if we get john back we can keep going with these questions but just thank you to the guys who sent questions in that we didn't have time to cover Stephen Fern. Oh, th there's a couple. There's one more thing I wanted to say. Yeah, go for a it. A couple of guys asked questions about where I was in Canada. It was at the Ocala Romance Center, which is outside Vancouver. That was one point. And the second point is the name of the tree. If you want to make money growing trees, it's called Monterey Pine, aka Pinus radiata, and that's the magic tree for making money at silviculture. Mm. All right. So huge thank you to Stephen Fern, Walter Poyoyo. Dat Geese, Ray Lewis, Bo said, counterfeits. We will endeavor to come to your questions in the future. Huge thank you. Also, so many kind people keep sending me stuff. And they send you that shirt. Three of them. Wow. Isn't it stunning? Look at the <laughs> buttons. They look homemade. This is from Claudio. And I will be putting a link to Claudio's shirts. Well, how did Claudio know the size of shirt you take? Because another one of our guests, actually a guy I did a collaboration with recently, a friend of Michael Emmett, who's one of our podcasters. Michael well, actually, from, you should stand up so people can see yeah, our definitely, size. Definitely. From Babylonia, 
That's Michael sorry. from Babylonia Media hooked me up with Claudio. So well, I actually look at the detail on this shirt. Yeah, it's 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 great, isn't it's it? Great. great. And I don't know. What are you six two? Six one. Six one. Yeah. So, well, are we about, the same? Yeah, about the same. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I know because one of your fellas said he met you and he was surprised at how big you were. Yeah, yeah. Because usually you're next to wild man and you look like a midget, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so huge thank you to Joe and James for coming out today. Huge thank you to all the new subscribers. We're approaching 700K. Thank you for supporting us. When so many dark forces have tried to take us down recently, we've survived two, 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 two channel terminations. Police have got involved, rival podcasters, trolls, black ops, you name it. We are still standing. And thanks to all of your love and support. So let us know in the comments what you thought about today's video. And I'm just stoked that I've got to see John today. Keep giving us a hug, man. Appreciate <laughs> yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming again. Yeah, always great. Pleasure. Cheers.